Welcome to those who have just joined us and a very happy Independence Day. We are now ready to begin our panel discussion on innovations in agriculture, the adoption and scaling challenge. We are delighted to have our panel with, with us here today. Mr. Mark Khan, Dr. Kalpna Shastri, Dr. L. Subian, Mr. Sean Cole, and Mr. Drew Sawney. The conversation will be moderated by Mr. Hemendra Mathur. Mr. Hemendra Mathur is co-founder Think Ag, a platform for accelerating the adoption of innovations in the agriculture space. He's also a venture partner with Bharat Innovation Fund, investing in early stage deep tech startups across sectors. He's also the chairman of the FIKI Task Force on Agri Startups. Welcome, sir, and welcome to all our panelists. Over to you, sir, to take us forward. Thanks, Roshni, and a very good morning to all of you, and a very warm welcome to all the panelists and participants. I also wish everyone a happy Independence Day. It's a special one. It's the 75th Independence Day for us. So wishing all, you, all of you uh, on this occasion. Uh, we have a very interesting topic to discuss, and I'm very fortunate that we have a stellar panel uh, to discuss this. I don't think any one of them need introduction, but uh, Probably I'll take a couple of minutes to briefly introduce them. Uh, we have uh, Professor Sean Call. He's a professor at Harvard Business School. He's been teaching there for over 16 years, and he's also founder and co-chair uh, for Precision Agriculture for Development. Welcome, Professor. I know it's probably uh, not a uh, good timing for you joining from the US, but thanks very much for accom accommodating. It's a pleasure to be here. Then we have Mark Khan. Mark is, as we you know, the founding partner at Omnivore. Uh, Omnivore, as most of us know, is one of the first, uh, uh, I, I, I would say the first investor in India who spotted agri-tech opportunity and has been very active for last 10 years or so. So Mark, very warm welcome to you. Nice to be here. Then we have Dr. Kalpana Sastri. Uh, she's the managing director at Egg Hub Foundation. Uh, Dr. Sastri is a distinguished agricultural scientist with nearly three decades of expertise in the area of agricultural research, technology, um, commercialization, intellectual property, innovation management, entrepreneurship, and startup ecosystem. Dr. Sastri, welcome to you. Okay, then we have uh, Azil Subian. Uh, Azil is co founder and CEO for String Bio. String is one of the world's leaders in gas fermentation, has a strong IP protected uh, platform called String Integrated Methane Platform that enables production of sustainable ingredients using methane. Hi, hi Azil. Hi, thank you for having me here. Okay. Last but not the least, we have Dhruv Sani. Uh, Dhruv is the business head and COO at Nurture.Farm which is incorporated and incubated at UPL. Uh, it's a full stack platform for farmers, enabling access to inputs, data, and market linkages. Hi, Dhruv. Hi, thanks for having me. Thanks, Dhruv. Thanks for joining us. So with that introduction, we get started. And before I hand it over to panelists, maybe I'll set the context in the next couple of minutes. Uh, if you look at innovations in agriculture, I think it's not new, you know, since the time from green revolution there has been some innovations happening at the time of green revolution the focus was on food security so we did uh, work a lot on the varieties but especially for crops like wheat and uh, paddy and that kind of helped us uh, to to build a, a food secure nation then if we uh, go back into history of course uh, white revolution started in 1780s i think did a great job in integrating the milk supply chain uh, from farmers to the consumer and cooperatives uh, played a very critical role in building that model and we all are reaping benefits of that now uh, if you look at early 2000 to 2010 2015 i would say it was an era of horticultural uh, revolution where a lot of emphasis uh, from the government and private sector went into uh, developing business models and supply chain for horticultural products and that's why uh, a horticultural production grew 
from let's say about 100 150 million tons to almost 300 million tons over last 10 uh, 10 years uh, national horticulture mission played a very important role in catalyzing uh, some of this growth um, if you look at agri tech innovations i think it took its root at around 2010 and since, since then it's been an interesting journey i would say the first phase was between 2010 and 2017 when we saw a lot of interesting uh, models in agritech space uh, which were i would say more in experimental mode where we saw a few entrepreneurs uh, trying to build uh, models for farmers uh, on uh, on access to markets access to infos access to data etc and uh, and i think everyone were watching with some skepticism that whether this will take off or not and I would say that next we started in something like 2017, 18, when we saw, I would say, large number of agri-tech entrepreneurs entering into the space. Many of them coming without any agricultural background, but brought a lot of, uh, I would say, technology expertise to the sector, uh, which kind of is much needed to bring process orientation to the sector, which is, uh, you know, has multiple challenges. And that, I would say, was an inflection point. And after that, of course, we saw significant uh, uh, sort of uh, interest coming from investors as well. Of course, there were a few investors who were impact, uh, investing in it for, for, for a long time. But uh, for the last three to five years, we are seeing a lot of sector agnostic investors investing in the sector and a lot of international investors who never did a deal in this space is, is very interest, are very interested to look at this sector now. And I would say the next phase would start now, where we are going to see how these innovations go to the masses. How do we increase adoption of these agri-tech innovation among farming community? There are a few studies which say that the adoption level is somewhere between 10 to 15 percent. So if we take about 150 million farmers in the country, uh, probably 15 to 20 million farmers have adopted some sort of um, agri-tech innovation and uh, hopefully benefit, benefited out of it. So I think that's the topic we are going to discuss today, uh, and uh, you know we got a great panel today. So maybe I can start with Mark, who's been investing in the sector for for many many years now and has a lot of experience, uh, and he's seen the space very closely. Mark, what's what's your thought on the adoption side in particular? What what innovations in agriculture are reaching out to farmers? Uh, what challenges do you see, and what are some of the solutions? You know. Uh, to drive this innovation uh, over the next few years. Over to you. Look, I think the... Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Amendra. I, I think the the story of adoption is, is kind of two separate stories, right? There are technologies to be adopted and there are platforms and marketplaces to join. I think when we say kind of 15 to 20% of, of farmers in India are you know engaging with agritech i think right now more of that engagement is on the side of the platforms and the marketplaces right so you know there are farmers that are sourcing inputs from you know from players like an agrostar or a big hut there are farmers that are selling to you know a ninja cart right or or a praman or um you know, a Vigro. And, and there are, you know, holistic, um, there are holistic platforms doing multiple things like a Dehat with, with farmers. And I, I think if you aggregated all of those different kinds of platforms and, you know, including financial ones like someone at the Neil Kumar on the last panel, yeah, I think you would probably get to 15, 20% of farmers are having some kind of engagement, including with the licious's, the country delights, right? All of these, the big baskets, all of these uh, essentially e-grocers that are trying to do farm to consumer uh, branding. I think the, the story of kind of deep tech, precision ag and, and more technology specific adoption is still earlier, right? If I look at, you know, if I look at those players that are less platform based and more tech specific, um, I think you know we're we're due for a revolution there. I think things are moving in the right direction, but I think it's still harder for for farmers to buy technology 
right, than to see technology embedded in a platform where otherwise they're, they're doing their normal kind of commerce of inputs, outputs, um, and financing. And so um, what I suspect, or, or kind of my theory in the evolution of this market, is, is that so much of what's happening right now is essentially, un or is essentially building an organizational layer, building a foundational layer over an incredibly fragmented ecosystem, right? Uh, when, when you have you know, 10, 11, 12, 13 crore farmers, um, depending on who's counting, um, you know, it's very, very hard to bring products to market. It's always been hard to bring, bring products to market, right? And, and if you think about what was required many years ago to bring products to market, even if you had a single interesting microbial product, or let's say you had a killer app, right? In that earlier era, you were having to go and build out dealer and distributor networks to kind of reach those, those farmers. You were having to put out a field force, even if all you had was a single product. And so I think what's, what's changing is with this foundational and organizational layer being built, not just at the level of the farmer, but also across uh, the Mundis with the Arthias, across the midstream, right, across the Kiranas, right, that other players like a Jumbo Tail are doing. You're starting to, to have, you know, a layer of, of information and logistics that was never there earlier. And so my sense is some of this deep tech work, some of this hopefully agri-food life sciences work that still needs to be done, these opportunities in precision agriculture, once these platforms are sort of built out, you're going to then engage the platform to bring new products to market rather than you know, if you have an interesting idea, you have to build your own field force. And so um, I think that's pretty exciting. I think directionally we're in kind of, you know, when, when Hamendra talks about, you know, 2017 being the inflection point, I agree with that, right? 2017, you know, across 4G, smartphones, UPI, right? These were all sort of foundational technologies to allow, right? The, the growth of these fuller stack plays that were just simply not possible earlier. Mm -hmm. And, and I think as, you know, as these things grow, they in turn will create another wave of innovation over the next few years of more product specific innovation that can use these platforms to, to go to market. So that's kind of how we see it. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for giving a, very interesting perspective and i totally agree the foundational layer is so critical uh, in the form of platforms which can enable many other tech to reach out to farmers and i would also add probably foundational infrastructure as you mentioned uh, 4g and smartphones and finally we are seeing uh, uh, agri stack taking shape in some uh, of course early days but could be could be disruptor in next and uh, next decade or so uh, with uh, so much of data getting digitized and hopefully uh, building an open source platform for innovators to to build their innovations and APIs over and above it. So with that, probably I'll move to Dhruv since we are talking platforms uh, and Dhruv, I think Nature.farm, uh, you built a great platform pretty much under the radar. Uh, you know, I, I was not aware of this, uh, the kind of magnitude that at which you're operating now. So give, give us some some idea how you built it and uh, how do you see it benefiting farmers who are who are onboarded the platform so far yeah uh, and i think just picking up on what uh, mark has said uh, you know i've i was one of the entrepreneurs who who did a market linkage back in 2016 right uh, and and that became hyper pure and and the one learning i had back then was that we're all trying to go after the low hanging fruits nobody's actually tackling the big problem, right? And the big problem is that the farmer has every season one transaction, right? They're taking a risk in terms of putting money in, and then they're looking at a certain output. Uh, and that one transaction is broken up into multiple different uh, interventions. And the ecosystem is highly fragmented today, right? And so back to the point that Mark raised about a platform, there still aren't enough end-to-end -end platforms that are starting to 
solve for that single transaction for the farmer. They are trying to bring that solution set in a very simplified way for the farmer. Uh, so nurture is attempting to do exactly that. We are looking at br bringing together not just, you know, the science of market linkage or the technology of, uh, you know, how to how to efficiently be more productive or or drive better yield, uh, but look at the complete solution set, the science of, uh, you know, how, what is the soil requirement specific to that farmer, right? Uh, how how do we bring the cost down? How do we build for better resilience for the farmer? Because ultimately, if we don't solve for the complete transaction for the farmer, there, there are four or five risks that the farmer inherently carries that could trip them over. So unless we solve for all of them, we're not going to be able to deliver a real outcome. So at Nurture, we are very focused on delivering outcomes for farmers going really deep in building that solution set. And, and we had a really interesting exercise. Um, last Rabi season, we were at about 8% of platform adoption, which means uh, of the services like the spray services and different services we offer, only 8% were actually going through our platform. So, you know, pretty much in line with the 15% number that was mentioned. Uh, we, we took up a challenge on how do we get this number above, you know, 50%. Uh, and we, we try to solve this using a different structural approach. Um, and for the first time, we introduced the gig economy into the rural sector uh, because we realized that, uh, you know, trying to build a large field force or, or trying to go door to door is just not something that, that is, you know, within the reach of our business model. So we, we introduced the gig economy for the first time in the rural sector. And in a matter of about three months, uh, we went from 8% adoption. And at the start of this Kharif season, we're at 99% adoption, uh, which means 99% of uh, our capacity, our services are being booked through the app. And that's giving us an amazing amount of data and insight into what farmers are seeking, uh, what is the, the demand pattern look like, what are the ag inputs that they want to purchase, and so on and so forth. And all of this has come on the back of this one structural change in terms of how we approach the farmer and how are we trying to solve the problem for them. Uh, the second thing that I think always helps is 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 building faith and trust in the in the brand, and that, that takes a long time as well, right? So so we, we, we focused on a couple of these things, uh, and... and the gig economy in the rural sector, I think, has uh, moved the needle in the biggest way for us. What it has also shown us is that there is a huge amount of untapped potential and a hunger for knowledge. Right? And we all know in the urban systems, uh, if you look at Zomato, Uber, any of these large platform plays that have unlocked a lot of value, uh, that value has been unlocked not because of the business idea, but in terms of the field force and how, how that has driven the adoption. And so in this instance, that, that was the one lever we went after. And, and it's really interesting. Uh, and it's really heartening to see because the opportunities that people are hungry for are sitting right there. These are really you know, good agri graduates who just don't have the job opportunities and are actually coming to the cities for a gig economy uh, opportunity. So what we're trying to do is reintroduce back the right opportunities in a very end-to-end -end seamless transaction way for, uh, for servicing uh, the farmers in the ecosystem that they they're already in, and 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 that's really helped us scale and drive technology adoption in a big way. Thanks, Rub. It's very heartening heartening to know the adoption level of ninety nine percent, and I think good you mentioned the role of gig economy in in rural areas. I think it's less talked about, but I think that's the opportunity which exists. And fortunately, agri tech can open it up big time for. Not just agri graduates, but I would also say a lot of rural youth uh, who want to do something beyond farming, right? And that's where uh, you know gig economy sets in. Uh, we already have multiple examples of you know youth doing aggregation and uh, providing multiple services. Uh, some have also started a uh, few startups are also working with them to train them on how to fly drones and stuff like that. So I think that's quite fascinating. Uh, so with that, I'll probably move to Kalpana. Uh, Kalpana, uh, you know, if you look at the whole agri-tech evolution, I would say incubators have played a very critical role. The multiple incubators, you've been associated with some of them, uh, like ICR, NAM. I work with CIACO. Then there's a Bill Grow. There's an Indigram. There's a 
increase set and there are many more i may be missing quite a few names uh so i think that role is still very important given of course we have you know we're fortunate to have 1000 plus agritech starters my personal opinion is that there's a place for maybe 10000 you know if you really do if you want to solve all the problem that indian agriculture is facing so it's not a winner take all market and there are sort of opportunities for many many entrepreneurs who want to get into the sector so how do you see role of educational institutions research institutions and and incubators in sort of building that capacity right from you know right from seed stage to poc to pre series and onwards and you are on mute kalpana can you unmute i did okay uh, thanks a lot uh, himendra and um, first of all of course uh, greetings for the special day of the year today to all the panelists and to the audience uh, i say that because Uh, with this sense of independence, it is that word independence is. Kalpana, can you be a little louder? Can you be a little uh, louder? It is that uh, uh, sense of independence which is also needed in uh, some of our uh, um, R and D institutions, including the universities. Why do I say that? Is uh, the uh, Himendra mentioned about green revolution? it was in a different model which we had you know and we are all products of green revolution i myself i am so we were it was more of a a, a directed type of approach which was went uh, in you know in segments but today everything has changed there's an immense amount of paradigm shift which everybody talks about so we have people like mark or uh, you know dhruv entering the space and most of the uh, you know r and d sector which for decades has been in public sector suddenly has a lot of uh, you know uh, uh, entrants coming into the systems so what i would say uh, there definitely there is space for more incubators because incubators will uh, it will be a single window approach to enter the rich heritage of r and d institutions which they are uh, 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 staying on now why uh, my experience i was in a idea as he said yes uh, it was a great experience for us to uh, actually start but if i start telling the story of how i started and how we went through it will take uh, a lot of time what i'm trying to only say is it is challenging and the challenges still continue despite the fact that there are many incubators across that's because you are trying to set up a semi business like uh, uh you know facility in a very rigid environment which is grown over decades and the change is coming so i think the first and foremost if especially in case of agritech which are very very disruptive and you know without our knowledge they disrupt the whole systems and that's what has happened in the last 3 4 years acceptance is a little slow and i think incubators play a very crucial uh, role particularly persons who are leading the incubators if they can play that crucial role that change would definitely come as a wave that's what mark was saying we need that wave uh, i have been through a lot of uh, journey trying and i still remember i don't know whether hemend remembers when at uh, agnext came in the type of resistance i had from my r and d teams to even make them talk to the uh, you know aspiring entrepreneur is a point which i would like to focus on there's lot of things lot of ideas the good ideas need to be nurtured the good ideas cannot be turned into new products or processes unless there is that nurturing ecosystem and i think uh, most of the universities we have about 70 plus universities in this we have a, a huge icr setup they need to come out of those silo approach and you know uh, think big so that uh, a sort of a collaborate i'm not talking in words i really mean it practically that we open the doors and let the collaboration seemingly come out when seamlessly coming 
seamlessly seemingly coming into the system so that uh, uh, you know ideas can be nurtured uh, just a, a little word right now i'm working in ag hub i find um, this is in based in the state agriculture university in telangana and uh, one thing is the ecosystem here i'm trying to bring out what the ecosystem and the policies can do to trigger innovations if there is a nice ecosystem and a policy intervention which leads towards uh, you know ag tech i think the revolution can happen the model i am trying to talk about is we are having a hub and spoke model we would like to have a hub in our main campus in hyderabad to attract all those urban based entrepreneurs with those big ideas and try and develop spokes in the tier 2 tier 3 cities where i can bring and build rural entrepreneurship i don't make ag tech only as platforms i'm looking at a bigger picture of ag tech in the agri food systems where the rural youth which hemendra was talking can be actually uh, you know brought bring that change into their system that's for me at this point of time thanks kalpana i think two very important points you raised in terms of reorienting our institutions and i i totally agree being an agricultural graduate uh, i think a lot of courses are becoming obsolete and uh, i think one thing which i have been pushing at my college um, is to you know integrate courses on data sciences in agriculture stream i think agriculture is a heaven for data scientists you go to bangalore data scientists cost 30 lakhs 40 lakhs 50 lakhs and uh, you know I, i really wonder and and most of the data scientists who work with in ag tech space don't have an agricultural domain knowledge so if we can combine the two i think it it's a great combination uh, I, i'm sure you must be having a similar that, that arranged marriage is taking a lot of time <laughs> <laughs> yeah so we have to force this marriage somehow with with, <laughs> with our networks and uh, you know things like that and uh, and i i think another thing that you mentioned about rural and rural entrepreneurs and my experience mostly coming out of my trips to many villages that you know if you have to take agri tech to masses that that is a very important role these rural entrepreneurs have to play because for farmers the trust is very critical as dhruv also mentioned and that trust is not going to come from someone who's coming from bangalore or delhi or mumbai i think it has to be someone who's part of the local ecosystem and there are a lot of entrepreneurs who are doing and i see even if you can create a lively livelihood opportunity of the extent of 10000 rupees a month or 15000 rupees a month that's a good trigger uh, for for them to adopt and take these solutions to the farmers uh, so it could be a vle it could be an fpo it could be an ngo it can be even local panchayat and i've seen some of the very proactive uh, panchayats in some of the some of the states i just wanted to, uh, to just drive the point here again Uh, we do have uh, startups working with us uh, who are in the rural areas now currently and i'm really happy to note that some of these startups which are uh, many of them are bootstrap but they are now uh, providing jobs uh, to rural youth, youth who are actually trained in the polytechnic colleges there we have a, uh, another layer of agri polytechnics uh, in telangana so those students and uh, they they get a good handsome pay uh, on the services structures you can have a drone but you need to run the drone uh, with the uh, application in agriculture and these uh, small sector of uh, village boys who are in the rural colleges uh, are very important to be nurtured at this point of time right absolutely kalpana uh, with that i can move to shawn shawn uh... you know if you look at indian farming and i'm sure you must be aware 80% 85% is small holder farming uh in fact today when prime minister was speaking on independence day uh, he he did mention about need for focus on small holders farmers in particular and that's a large population 120 million farmer plus uh so what's your view given the fact you co-founded pad what's your view how do we take this innovation to small holder farmers in particular and uh, with your experience what kind of impact have you seen you know uh, for the Great. farmers who have adopted some of these innovations 
Great, great. Thank you. It's, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, and I, I, I've been coming to India every year since 2000. I think this may be the first calendar year I don't get to come. So this is, this is subbing in for that. Uh, let me tell you very briefly about Precision Development, which is a nonprofit that was co-founded with Michael Kramer, who's another economist at Harvard. It's based on research I was doing in Gujarat uh, with Avaz Day, which was delivering very simple mobile phone vo mobile phone based voice messages to farmers uh, and collecting information from them. They could call in and record a question and then the answer would be sent back to them also by recording. And so Michael, who'd been doing similar work in Africa and I said, well, we're academics, we're not really poised to develop and deliver this type of service by ourselves, let's found an organization. So we started a nonprofit about five years ago that's now reaching about 5 million farmers uh, around the world in, in, in 11 countries. Uh, and you know, I, I think we're, we are a nonprofit and I think we, a lot of this talk has been on uh, private sector. And I think that you know, private sector is a super important uh, player, but we were focused with a real mission to reach the very poor, the smallholder farmers. And five years ago, you know, it wouldn't have made sense to even collect a 50 rupees or 100 rupees subscription fee from a smallholder farmer because the transaction costs associated with handling that cash might have been half half of the amount of cash that you could have gotten and the marketing costs and all those things. So we started out with a model uh, that's free to farm and we focused on being very low cost and very easy to use. Uh, so uh, we, we, we use voice mostly. We've moved also to, to, to WhatsApp uh, and, and text messages in Africa, but we have not invested yet uh, in app just because we're not seeing a huge adoption of, of, of data services among the very smallest, uh, poor, poorest smallholder farmers. And I guess what, this diff what we think differentiates our mod model is really a research emphasis. So we, uh, all of our interventions are based on randomized controlled trials or involve eventually randomized controlled trials where we really try to measure the impact on the farmer. Because as, when you step out of the market situation, you risk getting into a world where the government's providing a bad service, but it's free, but farmers don't have any other alternatives. So they sort of take it. There's not that feedback mechanism that, that you get in, in the private sector. So we do a lot of A-B tests or in Odisha, we're working with the government there. Uh, we've identified 10,000 farmers, 5,000 of them. Uh, we've, and all 10,000 farmers, we've walked the, their, their plots with, uh, GPS devices and we'll measure their yields by satellite. Half of those 10,000 farmers will get our service. Half of those uh, 10,000 farmers won't. And we'll track over two or three years how their agricultural practices uh, and yields change uh, in response to the services uh, that we're offering. So we have a very human-centric design focus, keeping it simple, hitting the real basic needs uh, and, 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 and trying to stay uh, very close uh, to the farmer. So, so that's the approach we've had. I think you asked, you know, what evidence of impact do we have? We've done at least a dozen RCTs already. We published in Science, uh, which is a leading uh, academic journal, a meta-analysis showing about a 4% gain in yields from our interventions. And I'd enter emphasize that our interventions are super low cost. So right now, uh, our average cost to farmer is about $1.34 per year, uh, or the average cost to deliver. It's free, of course, to the farmer. So we're talking something like on the order of 100 rupees uh, per farmer to year. And if you just do back of the envelope benefit cost ratios, you're getting a 10 to one uh, benefit cost ratio. So it's it's uh, an approach that's working and is scaling. Uh, very often we're able to find governments, either state governments in India or, or governments in other countries that are willing to pay for these services because they're so cheap and they can reach such a large population. But we are not and we don't necessarily aspire to be financially sustainable on our own or, or even profitably because we're a, a mission driven organization. So let, let me stop there. Thanks, Sean, and compliments for the wonderful work that you're doing. Uh, I hope you'll get to India soon. And India is changing very fast. So hopefully. That's you... right. You, you you don't come for a couple of months and it's changed a lot already. <laughs> yes. Even we get surprised. I'm sure uh, you'll also see a lot of changes happening, especially in the rural India. Uh, so with that, I'll go to Azil. Azil, uh, uh, the question to you, if you look at Indian agri-tech, uh, I would say 90, 95 percent is, is digital tech, you know, and somehow the biotech component is kind of lagging for various reasons, you know. Uh, if you look at U.S. agri-tech, probably 60 percent is like biotech uh, and so is for other countries like Israel and maybe Netherlands and stuff like that. So how do you see... Uh, egg biotech scaling and especially now we are seeing government coming up with a policy for biostimulants right which can potentially solve a lot of challenges that we see on the agri input side uh, so what's your view on egg biotech and how do we scale these innovations how do we take it to farmers 
Yeah. A very interesting discussion, Himindra. And yeah, um, like you rightly uh, highlighted, right? Ag biotech is a very interesting and challenging space in India. Um, I'll address it from our own personal experience as to what String is facing as we are trying to scale and commercialize our products in India today. Right? So we uh, we want to bring to market a very sustainable biostimulant solution that we're now introducing into the market. And uh, you know, in the last I think hour or so, we've talked a lot about the tactics of how to reach these solutions to the farmer. Right. But perhaps one thing that is missing in this conversation is the strategy of how to get your farmer to switch. Because one thing that we see that's happened over the last um, you know, couple of decades post our green revolution is there's a lot of bio, quote unquote, solutions that's thrown at the farm, right? And it's almost like if you talk to a lot of farmers, it's either called bio or it's called medicine, for lack of a better word, right? And uh, given how how um, on the edge the farmer's profit is already is, the second the farmer senses any change in the crop characteristics, a slight dulling of color, a slight uh, til, uh, you know wilting, they are throwing more and more and more medicines at the crop. Right. And also the the you know the fertilizer use, if you look at what the farmer is using today, it's huge. It's you know, it's uh, if the crop actually needs only let's say a kg per acre, we are dumping almost two to three kgs per acre and then facing all the you know the uh, effects of doing that as well. So uh, if you ask me, I think in terms of being able to scale ag biotech in India we may have to go through a cycle of unlearning, right? In terms of um, unlearning, differentiating what we think is bio, which today bio means your fertilizers, your pesticides, your insecticides, your actual real bio fertilizer or bio-based solutions, they're all getting used under the tag of bio. So I think there's a fair amount of unlearning that needs to happen. There's a fair amount of unlearning that needs to happen in terms of what is actually needed from a crop nutrition perspective, right? Because uh, excess fertilizer use means water runoff, water quality goes down, nitrous oxide emission, greenhouse gas emission, like the impact of to the overall ecosystem is so huge that um, we really need to learn to say, okay, looking at it from a long-term picture, what are the short-term um, uh, habit change that needs to come into play? So I think for us, you know, as we bring these products to market, I've been quite amazed that everything from, you know, your chemicals to everything is today coming under the bio tag. So unfortunately, I think a lot of unlearning has to happen. One right thing and, um, you know, kind of a very leadership position that we've seen from the Indian government is the whole biostimulant policy. Uh, because, you know, we've been one of the leaders in the space. There's, you know, Europe is still trying to navigate what its policy is going to look like. US doesn't have a policy out as yet. But India has already put out a biostimulant policy today. And I think this will really help clean up a lot of the agri inputs that are going into the sector today and i think you know that will help from a pool perspective right because today as the a lot of the spurious products in the market get cleaned up science-based solutions now have a lot more room to play okay so i think from a policy perspective that definitely helps but for real ag biotech solutions to um, play in the marketplace in indra i really think we need to go through a campaign of relearning a lot of the practices that are currently in the market today. Thanks, Ajil. And I can say there are a lot of tailwinds from consumer side, especially need for safe food, traceable food. And okay. of course, organic has always been a sunrise. The challenge it could never take off because there's a lack of, lack of trust between the farmer, between the consumer and the producer, right? And that's where I think bio can play a very important role. Uh, so I think there's a there are good signs, but you're right. We need to probably relearn, unlearn, and uh, 
I think I still believe a lot of it is faith based. We have to move it to fact based. You know, we need to demonstrate mm -hmm. results. You know, to the yeah. farmers, uh, and uh, for farmer to move from a chemical to a byproduct, I, I I don't think it's an easy transition. We need to, uh, you know, because farmers uh, risk taking appetite or appetite is also limited. You know, particularly smallholder farmers. So how do we uh, build enough confidence in farming community that it works and is as good as or better than the conventional product that uses. I think it's is another challenge that need to be addressed. Absolutely. And if you look at it today, right, I mean, um, there's seed, which is your key input. There's water and water quality is constantly changing. There's all the inputs, right? Your base inputs like your, you know, your fertilizers, your NPK. And then on top of that, your your pesticides, your crop nutrition, your inputs that are coming in. And large fourth, which we always have to tackle is your whole climate, right? Uh, this year it's hot, next year it's cold. And, and but we are trying to bring in innovation, keeping all these variabilities in mind. I mean, we say India, but if you look at the ecological zones within India, Right, even between North Karnataka to South Karnataka is a huge variability, right? So, um, and I think, like you rightly said, the, there's also a little bit of fatigue from the farmer side, right? In terms of the number of solutions that have been given to them. And if you see, you know, a lot of them are just basic micronutrient solution that today are getting, you know, bundled into a bio tag and being introduced to the farmer. So it's, um, yeah, hopefully, you know, with all the digital platforms coming in place, with all the uh, innovation that is happening in terms of being able to track this, I think the ag biotech sector will be able to leverage a lot of the other innovation that's happening to get the right fact-based, science-based solutions to the farmer. At least that's that's our hope, right? We are We are very much in the game of being able to do that and um, i mean the, it's a it's a vast gap in india right now even whether you're looking at nitrogen utilization whether you're looking at crop nutrition um there's a lot of products but very very few science-based products in the market today but to be able to scale this well we have to go through the campaign of really you know cleaning out a lot of what is being used in the market today and guiding the right practices to come into the foray. Thanks, Ajil. I'll come back to you. Uh, I'll go to uh, Mark again. Mark, uh, if you look at the investment landscape in agri-tech, and I think you've been watching it since beginning, uh, it's changing. Of course, initially, we saw a lot of impact investment coming into the sector. But for a change, we are seeing a lot of commercial investors also putting in money. And I think you, you guys have played a very critical role in bringing many investors into the sector uh, being the first investor in many such deals how do you see see this changing you know how do we catalyze more dollars into the sector uh, how do we uh, you know there's always a question when would we see the first exit and when will we see the first unicorn etc you know what's your view how how do we can get more capital into the sector and uh, how can we make it more attractive for many investors who are sitting on the fence you're on mute, Mark. I was saying, I don't think a lot of investors are sitting on the fence anymore. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it, it, it's more like what we actually face right now is a bit of uh, catch up, right? So, you know, uh, Lightspeed has taken their first bet in this space uh, in, in Vigro. Um, you know, Excel took most of their bets in this space back in 2016, 17, but are getting active again. Sequoia has been consistently active since uh, since coming into Dehot and has done a bunch of things through Surge. Um, Matrix has now made you know three bets. Um, so I, I I don't I, I wouldn't actually agree that on the early stage that it, it's it's kind of about getting more more capital in because the reality is if you take a look at the investors that are active as generalist VCs in India, almost all of them have become active in agritech with very few exceptions. I can like think of like Stellaris. Okay, you know they haven't yet, um, and I suspect that they you know that they will. Um, but I don't think that's the case. I also think from a latter stage perspective a lot of the growth investors in the ecosystem are also taking bets right rtp has you know has taken multiple bets in this space 
Um, I think we'll see other players start to do so. Bertelsmann has, um, you know, uh, so so I, I don't really see the concern on on capital the same way that I think was completely true in, in 2016, 17. I think more and more people are coming in every month, and I think more and more investors at every stage are coming in. I do think that there is more of a challenge of what is getting funded versus the aggregate amount of funding. When, when we look at, um, at kind of the, the math of what gets funded, we think three major themes get funded. Okay, We look at Omnivore looks at six themes. Three of them are the ones that generalist VCs like. They like farmer platforms and fintech. They like agri B2B marketplaces. And they like farm to consumer brands. Those three categories are... 90, at least 85% of the funding uh, in the sector. And I think we have a great challenge in front of us to get more specific deep tech and life sciences innovations funded. Deep tech is still easier. Um, you know, we're going to announce a, a round, a follow on round coming into to Target Sense soon, for example. Um, and that's a robotics play. And, and they were able to raise more. And, I think a lot of innovative digital hardware plays are able to raise more, but there is almost no money in India for agri uh, for agri food life sciences. There's nothing. It is a, a you know a void. It's also a void from a pipeline perspective. It's not even you know people are always like, well, you know, are you guys just not taking the bets early enough? And I'm like, no, there are no bets. Like there are no entrepreneurs there. It's, it's, it's the line that I use again and again and again and again, because it's provocative, not because it's necessarily true is that there are more Indians working on, on bleeding edge biotech in three kilometers of Boston than the entirety of the subcontinent. And I'm sure Kalpana Madam might disagree with me, but in terms of commercializable tech, right? That's the challenge that I throw down is how is that possible? How is it possible that we have more people with Indian passports doing bleeding edge biotech in Boston than in the entirety of India? And, and how can we fix that? And that's something that we're starting to, to look at, at maybe even changing Omnivore's approach to try to address. Um, going to your question about exits, uh, exits are coming. I mean, we, so, so I know that it, it's always one of these lagging indicators, right, by definition. So people for a long time, right, in the in this generalist startup ecosystem, right, were like, there are no exits, there's only Red Bus, and there's no exits, there's only Little Eye Labs, and then it was like, bam, 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 right, then it was Flipkart, then it was something, you know, then something else that now no one talks about exits anymore, right, we just talk about how many companies are going public. I think it's a similar lagging indicator, you know, we've exited Mithra to Mahindra. Right. We did a classic strategic exit of, you know, of a company. Um, we're doing that with another one of our portfolio companies to a global strategic right now. Um, there's more of that coming, I think, for sure. And I think that there is going to be a wave of, of IPOs as well after a few years. We've seen that there's a massive up appetite for taking things for, for ag businesses in public markets in India. Right. I think I, I think we've seen we saw that when Goldrich Agrivet went public. We saw that when multiple, multiple ag, you know, large ag companies have decided to hit the market. And I think Agritech is going to be no exception. I, you know, I hope that that's the future for for Dehat. I hope that that's the future for um, for Aria. I hope that's the future for someone at the right. I, I think it's it's you'll forgive, you know, the the enthusiasm of an immigrant for for his host country but um you know i, I think it is a freaking travesty that the most successful exit in the startup ecosystem was to an american multinational right sorry i i care about swadeshi i care about that that you know and i think it is better that these companies go public and are owned by large diversified sets of shareholders, preferably domestic ones in India, right? That is a better home for that equity, right? And for that wealth creation than the Chinese or the Americans or any other foreigner. 
So um, I, I, I realize I, I sound out, you know, I, I sound very political here, but um, it's something that I deeply believe in. And it is Independence Day. So, um, you know, as we look at the future of exits in, in, in Agri, um, let's try to keep that in mind that, you know, 75 years ago, we, we stopped being, you know, controlled by foreigners and we shouldn't allow our economy to be um, in, in, in a flight to tremendous greed, um, you know, as we look to the future, especially when we're dealing with a, a vertical uh, and, an, and a sector as, as critical as agriculture. Thanks, Mark. Interesting views. And I kind of echo your thoughts. Uh, even if you look at Flipkart, one, the first mega exit, and uh, it took 11 years. Huh? And that's urban, e-commerce, evolved market, and a very evolved ecosystem. And agri-tech in India, on an average, is three and a half year old. It's a toddler. So I think people have to be patient. And on public listing, I see a huge opportunity. In fact, I awesome. recently saw a McKinsey study which compared uh, agribusinesses who are listed on the stock market vis-a-vis -vis the Sensex return. And I was surprised the, the the returns were far higher than the average Sensex returns over the last 10, 20 years, so, which is a good news. So I clearly uh, see an opportunity that Indian agri-tech could be potential uh, a listing opportunity. And anyway, the share of agribusinesses on the stock market is less than a percent for a sector, which is 18% of the economy. So clearly, I, th I think there's an opportunity to go public no i mean i think it's 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 a massively under penetrated sector and that's why every time an ag company goes public in india right it's oversubscribed many 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 times and so i think it's going to be the best source of exits right for for the most successful companies and i think it's it's, it's the right way to you know to, to to do those exits you know that's not to say that there's not an opportunity in in strategic exits right but i think by definition those are going to be right the, those are going to be the, the the doubles and the triples right the sixers are going to be going public and, and i hope that that's the case right i don't think that I, I hope that the the end game for for a sixer isn't selling to you know walmart or amazon or uh, you know forgive me mukesh Ambani. right Great. Uh, with that, probably I can move to Dhruv. Dhruv, uh, you know, it's been asked multiple times now in terms of role of corporates in uh, in building agri-tech models, in supporting agri-tech models. I think one approach which corporates have taken is is a VC route, right? Like Mark was mentioning, Mahindra has invested in a couple of deals. Internationally, we have seen uh, many investors like Syngenta Ventures. They've also done a couple of deals in India. Uh, John Deere has acquired quite a few businesses, so has DuPont, right? Uh, how do you see this spanning out in India? A few couple of weeks back, I was asked a very interesting question by a journalist. How do you see relationship between agribusinesses and agri-tech? Uh, and I don't think I have an answer, but what I told him that uh, it's very similar to what, uh, what the relationship between a bank and a fintech. They compete somewhere, they collaborate somewhere, right? So it's... It, it's, it's an interesting relationship and it's still evolving. So it's very difficult to give a definitive answer. But you being a corporate incubated uh, platform, how do you see role of corporates, you know, who have been in the sector for ages and uh, understand the pulse of farmers and uh, have a deep network and trust among farmers? How do you see they playing out an agri-tech uh, approach? It, it's a it's a good question, Himendra. It's a it's an odd couple to start with, right? Uh, you have uh, a typical, uh, you know, corporate ag business, a traditional ag business like UPL or a Mahindra, which has been you know deep in manufacturing, uh, deep in production, more industrial in nature, right? And then you have the ag techs, the the, the DNA is very digital, native, and trying to solve problems in a very data driven way. And so the DNA of these organizations typically aren't the same. And uh, the story wasn't much different for Nurture, right? Nurture uh, was brought together uh, uh, essentially to build on some of the early learnings and ideas around farm mechanization and some uh, successes that UPL had. And so we we seeded a team and we we brought in professionals, uh, you know, from across the industry. Uh, we've built a team of about 250 people now. Uh, who are all digitally native and and it's it's a very interesting mix in terms of people who understand how to build platforms how to 
use data science, how to integrate different technologies and, and create a solution set versus people who really understand, uh, you know, one core sector that they've been operating in. And, and I think it's a very unique challenge and it's not an easy one to overcome. It's not easy for the corporate because they, they will tend to hold on to a certain idea of how they've been successful. Uh, whereas the ag tech needs to be absolutely uh, operating in a more startup mindset. So I think uh, incubated uh, opportunities are tough to uh, kind of deliver on. But, you know, uh, we've been blessed with uh, uh, Jay Shroff, who's, you know, given us the complete latitude to operate independently uh, to that end. Um, within the last uh, three to six months, we've uh, actually last week on Thursday, we hit our millionth farmer on our platform. And uh, we've seen, uh, you know, the scale starting to hit in uh, that inflection point. We're seeing about eight to 10,000 farmers on board onto our flat platform every day now. And so uh, what's worked for us uh, is something we had to discover for ourselves and not necessarily learn from the corporate. Uh, and having that space to operate is absolutely essential. Uh, the other thing I'll call out is delivering on the outcome. Our approach of being very outcome driven, going back to what uh, you, you know, even Ezil said and, and uh, Dr. Kalpana, that these entrepreneurs can build trust in the local ecosystem. Uh, but the question is about relevance first. Are the solution sets you're bringing, how relevant are they to, to the farmer and how encompassing are they to their daily lives? If it's just one thing that happens throughout the crop cycle or at the end of it, uh, chances are they, they're going to have six or eight different options to pick from, right? So re relevance becomes really important. How often do you stay front and center of the farmer's uh, mind and and once you build that trust by delivering on multiple opportunities the adoption kicks in and so we are seeing that effect now we're seeing about a 50 percent of onboarding happening onto our platform pretty much uh, organic uh and uh, and uh, you know in terms of actual transactions through the platform about 50 percent of our farmers have already transacted through our platform right uh and so so these are these are interesting combinations. I think having having people come in from a digital native mindset to drive new solution sets is absolutely critical to to scaling and delivering. Great group. I think one one question is you know for a platform like Nurture, I think I'm sure you must be uh, also it must be going on in your mind. You know what components should you own yourself and what are the components which can potentially be outsourced to other startups? You know. That's a soil testing, for example, you know, or let's say detecting pests and, uh, you know, biostimulants as Agil was talking about. So do you have a strategy on where you can partner with some of the startups and where it becomes very complementary? Absolutely. I think, I think what we've discovered in the short amount of time over the last 18 months is uh, our strong muscle is in, is in kind of building the platform and driving that uh, information highway that farmers can connect with, right? Uh, we, we're literally building that uh, ground force, that ubiquitous platform that farmers can connect with. Uh, we are very open to now working with people who have great biosolutions or, or farm mechanization opportunities uh, could be the next. Uh, so we are already working with, say, multiple drone opportunities. There are you know, battery-powered drones as well as uh, petrol engine-powered drones. So we, we're looking at all sorts of uh opportunities that we can bring into the ecosystem because if we are about an outcome then we need to understand who's the best at individual uh strengths who's good at a certain bioscience who's good at a certain farm mechanization who's good at a certain soil wellness solution we're working with uh, uh you know so, uh, soil uh, solution sets all the way from canada uh, and bringing those mechanization opportunities so we can actually give a very custom soil recommendation uh, for as low as one dollar uh to a farmer in india right and so finding the the right solution set that we can integrate into this information highway is is what you know we're, we're really focused on and i think i think there's a huge opportunity here for uh for uh, the entire ecosystem to collaborate uh to deliver these outcomes as opposed to everyone trying to you know re, you know have their own field force and and and, and that's where i think that open mindset is really critical 
and i must say i have seen this ecosystem to be much more collaborative the fact that i do invest in other sectors as well i find agri tech to be very collaborative in many ways and you're right i think it's whether it's a corporate incubated platform or a startup platform it's very difficult for everyone to do everything right so that's that that's kind of open sub opportunities for everyone thanks yeah. rob uh, maybe i can go to kalpana now kalpana uh, i think building on your thought process of this hub and spoke you talked about uh in terms of building incubators in rural india and i think i've been having multiple discussion at the policy level if you have to democratize startup ecosystem in india you know you you have to look beyond eight or 10 cities you know where it is concentrated and that's where rural entrepreneurship become important so how do you build it how do you do you have any template in mind you know let's say there are 600000 villages in the country how many such incubators do do we need who should manage it should it be part of an agri university should it be independent should it be part of a kvk what is what are the sort of founding pillars for such incubators which are i would say very rare in in the ecosystem right now frankly dhruv uh, i'm still evolving mm -hmm. the, this model is still evolving at from our end and i don't know whether i'm co really uh, correct i think this would be a uh, first of its kind in the country also uh, having said that it's probably a little too early but i still believe collaboration is would be the key for it and how do i uh, reach to more farmers is i try i'm trying to look at the research and the extension ecosystem a typical university provides take that strength and also uh, uh, right now we are also with the uh, in fact we have also have a, a, a what we call an mou with nudge and uh, you know organized developmental organizations like apmas i mean we can't do everything ourselves but we can definitely build that platform in the rural uh, centers and try and uh, engage with the other partners so what i am uh, uh, driving is a more flexible approach which can bring all the partners together is exactly what uh, even dhruv was airing uh, everything cannot be done by a university or everything cannot be done by a corporate uh, and in this system of agriculture you will agree we have several uh, multiple layers multiple partners uh, everybody doing their each role it's not that things are not happening in the space they are happening but they are all happening in a discrete way they are all happening in a separate way so our intention and our approach is is if we can merge not merge but at least bring them and create that platform that would be my uh, approach completely uh, and then i think my at the end of it the aim of aghub is can we actually take this agri tech from the urban to the rural areas i mean can i build that bridge uh keeping a rural center there and instead of uh, you know all these years we have been here of uh, hearing urbanization and people leaving villages uh, can we have a utopian type of a uh, idea that uh, there will be platforms which will attract these uh, people from urban and uh, do the services for and then again another difference i think it's time we all realize it's agri food rural development please uh, let's not segregate agriculture food and the development at the rural end they're all they have to go synchronous and i think it's important uh, such platforms like today's panel we start highlighting that these are essential you can't have a, a agri tech drone running there if you don't have a taker like a, a you know a sustainable fpo and a large group of a pool of farmers who can take the technology and also they have to be financially sound they have to be ethically uh, you know bound by the fact that new technologies can bring that so trust of the farmer uh, i would just like to also uh, relate my 6 months of experience we have started a new program and i think you must be knowing about it because thinkag did uh, uh you know recommend some of our uh, startups from a pool of about 83 startups we could filter about 11 agri tech 
com uh, startups who agreed to uh, uh, be part of a program called Agri Tech Pilots. We, we have been running for the last one Kharif. The idea was to give them a platform of ground uh, uh, truthing of their uh, technology at the farmer level. Two things came out of it, the trust of the farmer and the relevance of their uh, technology at uh, the rural center, and also to learn to work with the technology expert from the university to you know, bring that science-based solution to their uh, idea and also win the trust of the farmers. Now all the 11 want to continue in the next season also and deploy it because they have found their own ways of running their business. So I thought this was a good platform, we thought. And this only emerged because when we were in AIDEA, I realized many agree to come. We, the first question we asked, have you, has it been validated by any uh, you know, R&D academy or somebody? So we didn't know. We don't know. We have an idea, but we don't know which crop, where. So my emphasis is location specific. And if agri-tech solutions come in a, a crop, I think that then, uh, you know, Mark won't have any inhibitions of funding and giving me, uh, uh, you know, funds for such entrepreneurs. That's the way I would. Thanks, Kalpana. Absolutely. I think the role of technical validation and it's very interesting, like soil testing I've seen. It's, uh, yeah. it's, it's, one of, it's so much in demand, but it's not so necessary that the solution which works in uh, alkaline soil will work in acidic soil or what works in UP will work in Telangana. And that's where, you know, you it's not just one validation. You need so many validations. Many validations, yeah. And uh, that's and where the... Also, uh, uh, I would like to add here, many of the startups, I mean, this is really their uh, pain. They come with the ideas, they're mostly bootstrapped. And then I, I say another layer of validation, they're really running out of funds. So we have to start thinking, how can we actually put in certain a level of, uh, you know, some, I don't call it seed funding, but some funding for validation no. is required. It's not like the other sectors. Here you're talking about connecting with farmers through the KV case through the, uh, you know, attics and whatever you have, it's, it's, uh, the scale is different, even for right. validation. Thanks, Kalpana. I think we have 10 minutes to go. Yeah, sorry. Maybe, maybe uh, <laughs> uh, before we open up to for Q&A, so I'll probably go to Sean again. Sean, uh, I, I want to ask you, given the fact that you've been uh, working across geographies, uh, you know, do, do you have a view how do India fares up with the other countries, you know, do we have something to learn from, let's say, Africa or in Indonesia or it's other way around? How do we stack vis-a-vis -vis other emerging markets when it comes to ACTEC, ACTEC adoptions? I, I, I would say you're you're quite ahead relative to many of the other geographies we work in. And I, I would say, you know, the, the interesting thing that I've noticed in my career, at H, I've been at HBS for 20 years, is 20 years ago, we might have taught a case study about something that's happening in the U.S. and people would come from around the world to learn about it. Now we've got American executives coming to, to business cl class in, in Boston to learn about innovations that are coming up from India uh, or South Africa. So I think you, India, you know, in all the countries in which our nonprofit operates, we're able to be the most creative and do the most in India because we can get really talented people at reasonable costs. We have access to, to technology, you know, data and, and phone costs are not, not, off the charts. So I think there is uh, a lot that India has to offer the world. And I, you know, one one thing that strikes me as I look at this whole panel, and maybe this is the, the goal of Charcha, is this, this is still quite India-centric and India-focused. And I would encourage the entrepreneurs and the, the VCs here to think about what solutions can you bring abroad? And I know there are examples like CropIn is working in, in a bunch of other, other other countries, but I think solutions that, that can be developed in India, we certainly do that, we'll develop a product or service in India and roll it out then uh, in, in other countries uh, as well. Okay. Do you see there's a merit in building regional corridors and international corridors for taking this innovation from one country to another? Of course, it's happening on its own. But yeah, no, I, I, I think what, it's one of the, the founding reasons for our nonprofit was that 
every country has its own interest in promoting its own smallholder farmers. And so you see Ethiopia developing this large national system to reach millions of farmers. You see this happening in different states in India, but they really focus on their own and don't spend that much time learning from each other, sharing their lessons with, with other countries. So we see a lot of value in creating, you know, something like a, a, a global expert that, that can help people critically evaluate and transfer knowledge across sector. I guess one thing that I would like us to pause for a second on is to reflect that in many settings, it's actually pretty hard to evaluate how effective these services or products that we're offering uh, really are, especially if you're talking about very smallholder farmers, right? So if, if you're thinking about Facebook and all you care about is user engagement, it's very easy to do the A-B tests and say, this is the right way to offer the product or the service. But if you're offering you know, advice on uh, seed selection to 200,000 farmers in a rural area, you don't have that feedback loop easily to go back and figure out what's happening unless you've got them enrolled in a contract farming situation or with PAD, we're starting to do GPS, uh, you know, getting crowdsourcing farmers to report their GPS uh, locations. And then we can use some satellite uh, data to get some, some, some feedback on their, on their, on their yield, but it is a much harder problem. And the, in, in some markets, who cares if you order a pizza and you like it, you're satisfied, you're happy, but in other markets like seeds, you plant that seed and you have a bad year. You don't know whether that's because somebody sold you the wrong seed, whether it was counterfeit or whether it was actually the right seed, you just got unlucky. And so thinking about how the market, the market hasn't done a great job at solving these information problems and thinking about how, how, how we can get better at that is, is, is one of the core motivating missions uh, of, of precision development. Thanks, Sean. Thanks very much. Very interesting views. Uh, uh, with that, I can go to Azil. Um, Azil, um, one of the challenges which Indian agriculture is facing, and I would say agriculture across regions is climate risk. And there have been several studies and reports that this is the problem that need to be solved yesterday. And we are just sitting on it and still think that this is the problem of tomorrow, right? So how do we, and I think there are a lot of ag techs. I, I've seen so many in India and outside India also working on water use efficiency, uh, energy efficiency and stuff like that. Uh, do, do you see we need to change our approach you know, when it comes to climate risk, be it water table, be it uh, challenges that we see on, uh, you know, changing of cropping pattern because of erratic monsoons or, uh, you know, sudden pest attacks and stuff like that. Uh, you know, how do we address it a, a, as an ecosystem? You know, essentially, you know, coming from a startup perspective, I know a lot of these solutions take a lot of time to go to the market, you know, still, I would say not many VCs are sitting to, to sort of invest in this area, which are especially climate focused. Uh, what kind of capital should come in? Should it be more like a catalytic capital? Should it be the government? Should it be grants? Should it be multilateral? Should it be foundations? How do we build scale in solutions which are targeting climate risk in, in particular? Thanks. Uh, that well, that in itself will take us another half a day, I'm sure, <laughs> to discuss uh, the many, many ways in which we can go about it. But um, so maybe I'll take two approaches. Given that you know, Sean was also talking about uh, looking global, right? Um, so if you look at the global, I think one uh, one aspect that really helps is to identify those two or three solutions and then to work together to scale, right? I think if you look at, I mean, if you look at the just the ag tech sector, uh, kind of three numbers that are very, very stark is, you know, ag contributes to 12% of global emissions, almost 40, 50% of methane emission globally comes from the agri sector. And almost, I think 30, 40% of the nitrous oxide emission today is from the agri sector. And uh, if you look at what are the solutions today that can help um, in the shorter term contribute to that uh, reduction, right? So that there's some sense of control of on the surface temperature rise. Um, so globally speaking, I think there's been a big push to look at uh, solutions that can reduce both methane and CO2 emissions in the short term, right? I think there's a lot of technologies that are coming out saying, what can you do with CO2? A few solutions saying, what can you do with methane? And I think it's about scaling those solutions immediately and quickly and working together. Uh, particularly coming to India, I think one of the um, one of the key 
impacts that at least we see, I think, Yamindra, that needs a lot of cleaning up, I think, is uh, particularly on the agri input side. Right. Um, I think the whole fertilizer use, both in terms of supply, demand and use, I think is a big problem that is um, that is facing us as Indians. And I think it's something that uh, we, we should be doing something immediately about. The second is water. You know, I live in Bangalore. All predictions say that in seven years, Bangalore is going to be running out of water. And uh, there are. Already, I think other players in the world are showing us what can be done, right? Like, for example, I came across Perth. Perth has decided it's not going to use uh, to help increase its water table. It's going to only use desalinated water. So I think we need some aggressive solutions to help overall with the water itself. And third, you know, and something that I think we should also think about, it's related to the agri sector but which is a heavy contributor to the whole uh, climate change is also how we deal with packaging in India, right? Given our population and given the fact that uh, Zomato had a very, very successful uh, IPO, it's also scary thinking about how we're also used to the convenience of how we consume our food today. And I think that's also something that the agri sector can look at. Anyway, to I mean, a number of different areas that we can talk about. But I think policy changes, habit changes, and two key aspects that we should look very aggressively. One is on the waterfront and the other is on the soil front. I'll just take 30 seconds to highlight one of the things that Mark was talking about um, in terms of the lack of life sciences innovation in India. Right. So I've spent more than 15 years in the life sciences ecosystem in uh, Bali and being in India, I think it's it's um, I would kind of disagree with Mark there. I think uh, the work that uh, bio, the Department of Biotech has done to really bring in that initial 51 crore to boost innovation in the life sciences sector in India is happening a lot. But I do see a significant lacuna in terms of the next level of funding that is required to support very, very key uh, life sciences innovation that is required for an ecosystem like India. Most VCs today are very averse to the risk that is involved in these kind of life sciences innovation. And I think till we cross that bridge, it will continue to be a lacuna for our ecosystem here. So a number of points, but yeah, I hope I addressed what you had highlighted there. As well, I think you're right. I totally agree on the point that you mentioned on need to become a little bit more aggressive when it comes to climate. And I would also add probably need to become a little bit more creative also. Because essentially it's the farmer who has to adopt, right? And I always say, you know, like if you look at PSL lending, we reduce farmer loan rate from 7% to 4% if farmer pays on time. But if we can build incentive, for example, that if we adopt certain climate resilient practices, can we follow the same formula? And fortunately, we have tech now which can measure the impact of these interventions, right? So there could be a lot of objectivity which can be built in. But we need to build some interesting financing products uh, which can uh, hopefully uh, improve the adoption among farmers. Again, I'll take 20 seconds. We're doing a pilot in Nandubag district in uh, Maharashtra uh, along with the uh, uh, World Bank WRJ group. And we have been able to pull in multiple stakeholders like VNB Advisory, uh, NABAD, uh, Samunati, uh, Rabo Foundation, a uh, few actors uh, like Bharat Agri and Drona Charya who are going to do this measurement. And whole idea is to, uh, and of course, a local FPO is to take these practices to the farmer measure what is the impact of these intervention and build models in financial incentives for farmers to adopt these models. So let's see how that goes. It's just the beginning. Uh, but I'm sure we need many more of those uh, to, to, to build incentives for the farmers to adopt these yeah. practices, particularly in a country where water is free and in many areas power is free, right? Why, why would farmer move to a, a climate resilient practice? I think that's something we need to think through. But clearly in terms of need, it, it is right there. Himendra, uh, if I if I may if I may just add uh, on the point you. of sus sustainability at at scale, at Nurture we undertook a challenge on eliminating the crop burning that happens in the north of India. It's a big climate issue. It's a big nutrition issue for the soil each year. 
Uh, and I'm glad to share that uh, this paddy season in the states of Punjab and Haryana, uh, we've, uh, on a pilot basis, we've undertaken five lakh acres where we are scaling the technology developed by IRI, the PUSA decomposer. And we've actually worked with NPP, which is one of the uh, bio solutions entity within UPL, to productize this in a way that it's scalable, this uh, technology. And about 30,000 farmers have signed up that they will not burn this year. And, and, and we are actually lining up our uh, complete fleet of uh, boom sprayers that will be spraying this decomposer in a very tight three week window to achieve this outcome, three to four week window, right? And, <clears throat> and the reason this worked to your point is the right financial incentive. The farmers don't have to spend anything to achieve this. Right, and uh, and how how do we scale this to five million acres and eliminate it completely? Is because we are now building a funnel of farmers who who trust us for this one act, and now we are actually transitioning ten percent of them onto AWD and DSR, right? And therefore, uh, there will be a fifty to eighty percent reduction in GHG per acre uh, across those fifty thousand acres, uh, and we are also now providing. 10% of that on a pilot basis at market linkage, right? So the financial incentive has to come from within the system. It has to be on an outcome basis. And the and unless we think at scale on how to solve for these, there is no one thing that's going to do it. We have to think of it as a single transaction. Uh, and, and I'd love to share more about this, but I know we're running out of time. Uh, no, Dhruv, that's great. I think that's a great example. And we need to build these success stories, you know, no one can change the world overnight, but uh, if we have these success stories, I'm sure there'll be a lot of incentives for us to follow. And, and that's a great project. Please keep us in loop, informed on what, what's going on. And I'm sure we can play a role in scaling it up. And uh, I want to go to Azil's point on, on, there's enough, on the fact that there's enough seed funding. Uh, and I'm sure uh, there is happening and, and the kind of role which DBT has played in building life sciences uh, startup ecosystem is phenomenal. Uh, I think it's, there's no question about it. Um, I think one reason as well, which I can say and Mark can also respond to this question is, I see a lot of these entrepreneurs uh, wearing an R&D hat, yeah. Yeah. right? And for them to go to a, uh, an entrepreneurial hat, I think it takes time. Because a lot of these are hardcore techies and the go-to market is not clear. and. I think that makes VCs nervous. I have seen some of these deals, great guys, great, great work they're doing in laboratories. But when it comes to laboratories to market, I think the gestation period, the GTM strategies, they're still not very clear, which kind of could be one of the reasons that you don't see follow on investment. Uh, but Mark, if you want to respond to this question. Uh, no, I mean, look, I, I, I think going to the point I made earlier, one of the, I, I wish what I what I saw were were great technologists. Um, you know what I oftentimes see are good ideas very quickly turned into small lala companies, right? And and then so if you if you think about what the way a biotech usually operates in 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 uh, the U.S., the U.K., or Israel, right? There's a real focus on getting the tech right proving the tech with you know actual trials and research and reams of data and then you know eventually launching not usually with your own field force but through b2b partnerships with with large agrochemical companies or licensing out your tech or something that that puts the the tech you know the, the biotech that you've developed as more central I think what we, we oftentimes, you know, see in, in the Indian ecosystem is bypassing all of those steps, right? It's basically, hey, I had a good idea. Have you done blind? Have you done research? No, I've, I've, okay. I've done some trials with a state agricultural university, but I've also immediately begun selling it. And by the way, I don't just have a, a biopesticide. I have a biopesticide, I have a biofungicide. Right. I have, you know, a, a soil uh, remediator. I have, you know, a bouquet of, of products, some of which are traded. And, and that's more often than not. I mean, the, the truth is, um, 
Errol is and, and strain bio is is a, a fairly remarkable uh you know uh, agri-food life sciences startup in india because they are they're, they're more like what you see in the rest of the world and unfortunately maybe i'm meeting the wrong entrepreneurs but what we've seen in the agri-food life sciences space in india is is not like that they're 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 moving towards commercialization actually far too quickly right and not locking you know nothing is patented nothing is trialed the ip isn't locked down right and uh, my my friend kirsten stead at, at dcbc bio which is one of the most active uh agri uh bio investors in the world um likes to uh likes to call those kinds of products it's in 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 kind of southern american slang mama voodoo's juju juice right um which is which is to say like they're they're you know cure all products that you know where where the actual rigors of the mechanism aren't even fully understood and and so um our hope is we're very keen you, you say there need to be more seed investors we're very keen to be that seed investor if we can find the right kind of pipeline and the right kind of entrepreneurs um we're in the process of doing two uh biotech deals right now um and and trying to trying to help build the ecosystem so maybe more to talk about here absolutely absolutely and to highlight um, you know i think You've highlighted a couple of key points there. I think uh, Hemendra and Mark is, is it a mature enough ecosystem where, you know, all the ducks are lined up? I don't think so. And I think there are two or three points which you've highlighted. One is uh, the lack of collaboration perhaps between deep science and commercialization, which happens very easily in the West. You know, I mean, as far as India is concerned, a lot of the academic institutes and private sectors still work in silos, right? I think, like, uh, you know, Mark alluded to uh, product testing, right? I mean, uh, we, you know, we are running testing right now in at least 15 different states all over India. It's not been easy identifying the right places, but we're able to do it because I think we have the bandwidth to be able to get through those hurdles, which a lot of other companies that I know in the ecosystem struggle with because it's the, the lack of clarity for getting the simplest of things done in the ecosystem is just unbelievable, right? I think, yeah, uh, silos, but, see, but also I think uh, going back to what I was trying to say is, I think when you look at BIRAC or DBT, to some extent, they have lit the fire in terms of at least funding those early ideas. But that next phase, if that next phase doesn't happen, there'll be a lot of small starts, but nothing never, never takes off, right? And I think unless we figure out how to address this, either through handholding or incubation systems, ecosystems, you know, we'll be talking about this 10 years down the road. Thanks, Azil. <coughs> I think we... Uh, we have a few minutes left for Q and A, and I have three questions in the Q and A box. I probably go one by one. The first is on thoughts on the ongoing farmer protest mm -hmm. at the outskirts of Delhi. Uh, probably I can answer that. Uh, second one is on uh, any success mo successful model of collaboration or FPO with KVKs. Uh, uh, third one is uh, will the source of innovation continue to be private sector? What are the implications of proprietary innovation? How do we think about open sourcing commons in the context of agri innovation? So, so these are th three questions. The first one I can take it. Of course, it's, it's, a, it's a political question, but all I want to say in terms of adoption, look, farmer is not going to adopt anything unless it shows an impact on his farm economics. And I've there are three or four dimensions to it. One is a increase in revenue through better market linkage, through better price discovery, through value addition, right? Second is optimization on cost of inputs through better data, better advisory, access to good quality product. And third is, I would say, de-risking of farming through better credit, better insurance. And the impact that I have seen, and I'm sure others on the panel can corroborate it, it's potentially the economic value of, let's say, about 30 to 40,000 rupees per hectare can be unlocked if you get all of this together, right? Uh, for a farmer who's earning, let's say, one lakh twenty-five thousand rupees a year, and that's whole whole lot of money. 
so you know regardless of form laws i would say agri tech has a value proposition which can genuinely impact the farm economics and that's how the adoption would improve i'm sure this economics would change for good as we see more and more innovations coming up and scaling to a altogether different level so that's my answer to the first question if anyone else want to take it up please feel free to do so uh any panelist who want to sort of answer the question number 2 and question number 3 roshni can you highlight those questions once again kalpana do you want to take it yeah 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 uh, this uh, question on successful model of uh, collaboration of a uh, f uh, there are many i mean this question is a little uh, a little too broad uh, the, i would like to dissect it in the sense kvks play a major role in first aggregating and bringing the fpos to the core they are also mandated in terms of training them along with nabards uh, Uh, and some of the developmental organizations like APMAS, uh, which is doing in South India, uh, particularly in uh, Andhra and Telangana, and in Tamil Nadu, you have other groups. You also have, uh, uh, you know, dedicated incubators. So, uh, like the one which is in uh, uh, supported by NABARD in uh, Madurai. So, and uh, if you, what you mean by a successful model of collaboration? Collaboration at what level? collaboration in terms of uh, um, setting up an fpo the functioning of fpos the modalities of fpos yes collaboration in terms of uh, uh, trying to take uh, the some of the technologies from the kvk and the university systems to the fpos there have been good successful models also coming so to that extent yes Thanks, Kalpana. Uh, Roshni, can you go to the next question, please? Uh, uh, Azil, Sean, Mark, Grove, anyone wants to take this up? Implications are the writing. Look, I, uh, I'll, I'll take, I'll take a stab at this. You know, will the source of innovation continue to be the private sector? Um, some. Right. I, I think there is a place for the private sector. I think there's a place for the public sector. I think there's a place for the engagement between the public sector and the private sector. Right. Um, that last bit is is probably what is still um, not I, I won't call it broken because I don't think it's broken, but what, which is not working as well in, in India. Right. The, the private sector um, tends to, you know, work on problems that have immediate commercialization opportunities. The public sector tends to work on, on products that may have no or innovations that have no opportunity for commercialization. But oftentimes both find themselves in the middle. And um, it's very critical that we build systems that that can channel public sector, university and institute innovation into successful commercialization and i i think we're still struggling with those systems i've i've used this example before so you forgive me but i remember many years ago uh, maybe 2014 i was at a icar institute and um you know i was having this argument with the director of a specific icar institute i won't mention which um where where i said look you know nothing you're you're really developing here is actually getting scaled up I, you know and i said maybe you need to move away from this approach of of working with so many small smes to commercialize things and instead you know exclusively license the tech that you're developing to one player that then will have the incentive because it's an exclusive license uh to really drive the sales and he said but mark my KPI is number of people that I have partnered with. And I went, oh, okay. Well, that explains why you behave this way. Because your KPI is how many useless MOUs you sign rather than the, the aggregate amount of sales or the number of farmers that you've reached. So we, there, there are elements of the system, the way the system has been built and the way that the, even the public sector is thinking about commercialization that are actually kind of broken, right? Because the idea is instead of sing, you know, licensing to someone and creating the incentives for success, 
your you know your incentive is to not exclusively license to 200 parties even if it doesn't go anywhere um so you know i i think you know what are the implications of proprietary innovation look these are these are debates that 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 we've all had right i i very memorably had a long debate on a stage at i am amdabad with vandana shiva about this right i think in practice if you look at markets that have strong ip right innovations do get into the hands of more and more players and those innovations are are better and stronger and it's not that all of the value capture in a competitive marketplace goes to a single individual. Um, I do think that there is still a role for open sourcing um, and, and open innovation, but I think we're still in the earliest days of, of proprietary and patented technology commercialization in India. And let's make a bit more progress on that before we start talking about you know, the need for everything to be completely open source. We barely scratched the surface of, of what we can do in terms of proprietary innovation. Yeah, I'll add one more thing, uh, Imendra, on top of what Mark has said. I think that there is a, a massive gap at this point in terms of, you know, what are market or customer led innovations as opposed to, you know, purely science based innovations, right? And, and like Mark said, you often find that there's great innovations that have happened and then they're, they're looking for somebody who's who's actually going to deploy them and then there are people uh you know like nurture who who are very open to partnering with anybody who has a good innovative idea or a product to scale um and so there's also the gap of identifying that right and there's a lot of these good golden nuggets that are hidden away and so how do you discover them how do you present them in a meaningful way and you know, um, we came across the whole Pusa decomposer because Arvind Kejriwal, uh, I think year before last, uh, had some success, and and they were talking about this uh, on the outskirts of Delhi. And so we started talking to IRI. But I'm I'm certain there's like a dozen such opportunities that need to be better understood, better curated, better connected, uh, and 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 then there's huge opportunities to scale them. Great. I really agree with both of them. I think coming from the same system, I know whatever they have heard is absolutely on the dot. Um, but we really have to come out of this. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. I think it's been a fascinating discussion. Uh, I know we are over time, but uh, thanks to all the panelists for, for their frank, honest uh, opinion on multiple topics. Uh, and as we conclude, all I want to say, I think one big takeaway for me is, uh, you know, we need to be, you know, there has to be a sense of urgency when we are looking at an agriculture. You know, we can't, we can't say that, you know, we need, you know, this problem will get solved on its own. There need to be a catalyzing effort. There has to be public-private partnership. There has to be a lot of collaborations. Uh, and to me, as we move from 75th Independence Day to maybe 85th Independence Day, I think this is the period for me where we need to 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 look at this sector with a very different lens that we we need to solve for it and and i think innovations all said and done will play a major major role in achieving our uh, goals of sustainability farmer incomes uh, trying to solve for climate risk and and that's where i'm one of my biggest hope is this army of agri tech entrepreneurs uh, who, who's who's come up in the last few years uh, and uh, I think they, they sometimes I say ignorance is bliss and probably m most of them come from non-agricultural background. I think it's a, it's, a, it's a blessing because, you know, they, they are not inclined to think in a certain fashion that these problems cannot be solved. So I think with that hope and optimism, uh, I would like to conclude this panel and I want to thank all the panelists, Kalpana, Mark, Sean, Dhruv and Azil for the participation and all the audience. Uh, participants and of course the the nudge team who worked with us in making this happen thanks to all of you and again wishing you a very happy independence day thank you thank you thank you thanks, thanks, thank, you. thank you thank you thank you to everyone absolute pleasure having you on thank you for a great panel this wraps up the rural development track of events at chapter 2021 but do stay tuned for the plenary in the main auditorium thank you and goodbye thanks everyone bye-bye Bye-bye.